my mic sounds nice. Check one. I said my microphone sounds nice when it is on. Check two. Welcome all you streamers back to another episode of Beyond the Rim. Hashtag BTR. And I am your host, the Dudster, Nesta Dudley. Stop killing black people. Period. How hot is that? Stop killing black people. My guest today is Valerie. Valerie is a sister of mine. She's not my blood sister, but she's a sister of mine. Valerie, welcome to Beyond the Rim. Thanks so much, Nestor. And we are here in the nice podcast suite of Urban Media Arts. This is the second time I've had opportunity to use this podcast suite. For all you streamers out there, you know that I take my podcast on the road and I have been doing remote podcast before it was fashionable to do remote podcasts. But let's get into this. Stop killing black people. Today, we're going to talk about two cases, two instances. We're going to talk about the George Floyd trial. Then in the second half of the podcast, we're going to talk about Dante Wright. George Floyd. Everybody knows what happened. The whole planet saw George Floyd being murdered by Derek Chauvin and trial recently happened. Chauvin was found guilty on all three accounts. And Val, you and I were talking about this during the whole thing. And you know, I was very skeptical. I kept on saying it could only take one juror and that Chauvin was going to get off. I thought that man was getting off. I'm glad he didn't. I'm glad I was wrong, but I thought he was getting off. Right. So this case was held in district court, um, specifically Hennepin, Hennepin County, the fourth judicial district of uh, Minnesota. And if they had obtained a mistrial, so a mistrial is when somehow the jurors are compromised or the judge feels that the that 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 for any that for some reason that a that an equitable verdict cannot be reached, the trial can be thrown out. So because there was a guilty verdict, there cannot be a mistrial because it's already occurred. What they can do is this. They have 60 days to appeal, which, which is exactly what they did. When they appeal, it goes to the appellate court, and then they can get a new trial. Now, in the new trial, bef- remember, before the verdict is read, if there is any impropriety with the jurors or they can establish that, there can be a mistrial, and the... Uh, the trial is done. It can be thrown out. Due to double jeopardy, once it's thrown out, they can't retry Chauvin, right? So it's not a matter of, unfortunately, whether or not Chauvin is guilty or not. All of us saw the tape. He killed the man, right? But if his defense, if his defense attorneys have a good enough strategy, there is a window for this guy to walk, and that's what's scary. Now, what would be an example of an impropriety of, of the of the juror? Okay, and 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 like, what's this like small window? I, I, I knew that this thing wasn't over. Again, I was glad that I was wrong. But then there's a sentencing process. We know that, and they, and the sentencing process is going to be eight eight weeks later. So there's plenty enough time mm-hmm. to try to have justice reverse, so to speak, or try to have like the not mm-hmm. not the right thing done. Okay. So I actually did some research on this. So there are a few ways where a judge can uh, can order a mistrial. One of them, of course, is if there is not a unanimous verdict. Say you have one person hold out. They simply cannot come to a decision. Uh, they can ask for a mistrial. The, uh, the uh, defendant's... Um, Attorneys can ask for a mistrial, and that's what I and that's what I personally was afraid of. I right. remember kept on saying Val. Right. I said, you know, all it takes is one. Right. All it takes is one. Right now, now the other reasons for a mistrial are a juror committed misconduct. So let's say a juror accepts a bribe, or they speak to the media, anything like that that would sort of taint their ability to come to 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 an equitable decision for them to make an unbiased decision, that can be reason for a mistrial. The other one is improper selection of jury, improper selection of jury. So this goes to what's called the, the voir dire. This is Latin, well, I don't know the exact Latin translation, 
but this is the questionnaire that they have, right? Uh, that that they that they give to the jurors, and both sides of the attorneys look to this voir dire questionnaire to determine a good makeup of the jury to make it fair, you know, for uh, both sides. So improper selection of jury can be okay. We're going to pick all white people. We're going to pick all redheaded people. Like just it's not it's not equitable. It's not a jury of your peers. Right, right, right. Or there or something thereof. The next one is that the jury was provided improper evidence. Uh, so maybe they entered into evidence something that wasn't cleared because from what I understand, before evidence is submitted. Both sides have to see it, so that allows the opposite side to help prepare their defense or or the or the or the prosecution. Now, the the question with this trial goes towards juror committing misconduct, which goes to juror number fifty two, Brandon Mitchell. So this is why. Um, uh, so Brandon Mitchell, juror fifty-two, was was a member of the jury for the for you know for the George Floyd uh, Chauvin trial. So Brandon said, "I I went to a rally for the uh, celebration of the MLK March on Washington back in um, in two thousand twenty. Now, as we were talking before the podcast." What he didn't mention was that he was wearing a T-shirt that said Black Lives Matter. And if I had the proper wording, I wrote it down. It said, get your knee off our necks with a picture of MLK, Martin Luther King in the center. And he was wearing a hat that had BLM um, you know, inscribed on it um, or embroidered on it. So I'm glad you actually broke that down because when you had first said that he was wearing a BLM T-shirt, a Black mm, Lives Matter T-shirt, yeah. what does it matter what apparel he was wearing? Of course, Black Lives Matter. I mean, folks that are out there that, you know, that are crying, mm -hmm. well, all lives matter, all lives matter. Mm -hmm. Val, you and I certainly know that all lives matter. Of course. But course. those folks that are crying all lives matter, mm -hmm. they should be equally upset that Black Lives Matter because right. if all lives matter, that means that Black Lives Matter. So I was like, what's, the, you know, the apparel? But when you say, that it's a depiction yeah. of the good Martin Luther King yeah. getting a knee on his neck and saying, take our knees off our neck, then yes, that just, that, that's 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 somebody that has already potentially has a predetermined yeah. uh, thing of the outcome and should not be on the jury. Indeed. And and also, you know, as for, you know, this is my own personal opinion, Dr. King espoused the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, nonviolent resistance, Dr. Martin Luther King never espoused violence. So there can be seen as a contradiction of having Dr. King's picture in the center of this, get your knee off our necks. Like if Dr. King was alive, I don't know if he would have liked that so much. But be that as it may, because of his position as a juror, this can be seen as being already biased. And because it was posted, I don't even think that Brandon posted this. I believe like his uncle or something posted the picture. They can use this to say, look, this guy was biased. And we actually, or rather, uh, Nestor printed out the voir dire questionnaire. So question number, let me get to question number seven. Let me see. I'm sorry. Question and number this voir dire is 14 pages long. Just, yeah, for, the, okay. just, just for the stream is out there to, okay, so, to realize. Let me talk, so let me see. Is this the, so this is the actual one that they use for the uh, Chauvin trial. Okay, so that's question number seven, but I, wait a minute here. But there was a question, where is it? Oh, they, it, this thing is long, everyone. But anyway, but however, um, there was a question that indicated, and I quote, did you or someone close to you participate in any of the demonstrations or marches against police brutality that took place in Minneapolis after George Floyd's death. So Mr. Bennett, uh, or rather Mr. Mr. Mitchell could have said, no, I didn't, I wasn't, you know, I, w I didn't march in, you know, in the, in the George Floyd marches in uh, Minneapolis. However, bias can be shown because of that T-shirt. Now, this, this is a sort of gray area, but like I said, if, if they grant... Um, if they grant a second trial and this appeal is successful, 
they can bring this up. So I don't, you know, so, and and when they do the voir dire, let me just say this, when they do the voir dire questionnaire for the second trial, right, they can tighten up these questions even more so that there's less of a gray area where if someone even answers one question incorrectly and they can prove it, they can call a mistrial. I was just going to say that he answered the question correctly. The, yeah. To, to, yeah he to the best of my knowledge, the yeah. question was, did you march in any type of this protest right. in Minneapolis? Right. And the answer is he did not. So he right. didn't lie. He didn't. He, he just didn't offer information. <laughs> but, in ter- but, right, right. but seriously, when someone asks me a question, mm-hmm. I answer that question. I don't offer more information. I answer that question. Right. So, again, you say it's a gray area. I don't, I'm not a legal mind, mm-hmm. and nor do I play one on Neither ac- am I. <laughs> access television or podcasts. Right. But the question was answered straight up. It was now on part three of the voir dire uh, questionnaire and part three, question six. Were you satisfied or unsatisfied with how the police responded? Now, uh, now, I haven't been privy to, to seeing uh, how Mr. Mitchell answered this questionnaire, but if, if, the, if, if the defense goes through these questions and they can establish that there was some sort of impropriety in how, in how any of these questions were answered, they can get the appeal and get that second trial. So all they need, all they need is to get that second trial and... And because because we all want this guilty verdict for most of us, um, there are some people who, who who disagree with the verdict, of course, and I respect their opinion. However, for those when you say most of us, because I want the guilty verdict, I'm hoping, yeah. Sister Val, that you're on our yes, side. Yes, oh my, yes, okay, I am. good, good. I am. I am. <laughs> however, however, there is a large set. There is a large segment of society that are that are more right leaning, and and as an American, I have to respect their point of view that believe that that verdict was incorrect, that George Floyd was a criminal and he got what he deserved. There are people who feel that way. What I'm saying is that for the defense, just based on law, if they're able to find in this voir dire, in this questionnaire, that any juror, any juror shows bias or answered incorrectly, it may be grounds to get that trial to appeal get a second trial, and when they get that second trial, having all the information that they have now, they can tighten the questionnaire, they can tighten it up to make for less of a gray area to try and push it towards a mistrial. And remember, once there's a mistrial, it's over. It's a wrap. He goes home and watches Netflix. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. It's over. It just takes one One. person. Right. And again... We all saw the tape. You know, I couldn't even watch the whole thing. It was so upsetting. But, I mean, to anyone who watched, yes, he had he had his knee on the man's neck. Let me speak up on this, Val. Yes, yes. I watched the whole nine minutes and 29 seconds. Yeah. At first, when it came out last year, we were under the impression we thought it was eight minutes and 43 seconds. Yeah. But I watched the whole nine minutes and 29 seconds. It was played on the HLN network. It was mm-hmm. the Friday before they deliberated. Right. You don't realize how long nine minutes and 29 seconds is. I started watching it. I was in my kitchen. A couple of minutes later, yeah. I was so enthralled, I moved it to my living room and watched it. And what the HLN network showed was all of the camera angles. So the camera right. angles, the camera angle from the stores, the camera angle from the store across the street, the the the, the cams, the body cams from the police officers, right, to the cams of the bystanders that were there just recording it, and they showed it all at the same time from different angles, and the audio was there, so you heard everything. You heard there was a little conversation between the officers that was on Floyd's back. Uh, one officer, to his credit, the officer Lang, I believe, he did say, shouldn't we turn him over? It was several minutes in, I think. Right. I think Mr. Floyd might even 
had already passed by that point, and Chauvin was just non responsive. Chauvin just did not care. And then the other officer, Tao, first of all, Chauvin and Tao, they were veterans on their force. Yes. And they've had they've had complaints before in the past on, on them, on both of them. Right. And Tao was the one that was keeping the bystanders back. Yes. There was actually a young lady who we would eventually find out that she worked for the Minneapolis Fire Department. She wanted to help Mr. Floyd wanted to, that this guy needs tender, this guy needs resuscitation, he needs something. And she identified herself as working for the fire department. And Tao said, okay, that's nice. Get back on the sidewalk. Yeah. So, but I just cannot stress for, for the folks out there who've seen that footage, nine minutes and 29 seconds is a long time. And just think about that pressure, how much pressure you think that was on, I'm asking you this, Val, how much pressure do you think that was on the back of George Floyd's neck? I mean, let's say Chauvin weighs 170 pounds with gear, maybe another 10, his shoes and everything. And you're being generous because I'm thinking yeah. he's, I'm thinking he weighs over two right. with all that stuff. And also, when you have uh, the knee, so you're, you're focusing... We're focusing the pressure on a localized area. So if you were to have a bed fall on you, right, because of the large square uh, square footage or square square inches, the weight is dissipated somewhat. So ostensibly you could have something fall on you that was 200 pounds, and you could live because it's a large object. When you have that much force concentrated on some, so let's say his knee is roughly five inches across, four, four inches across, that's a whole lot of pressure per square inch. And and just from my little bit of knowledge of, of, of how the body works, you've only got a couple of minutes. I mean, ostensibly, I'm going to give it maybe two minutes, you know, something, and then you're going to run into some problems. Once your brain is deprived of oxygen and you black out, your body goes limp. I mean, it, it. I mean, even if let's say he took his knee off of his neck at the six minute mark, he could have suffered brain damage. Probably did. You suffer. You know, it. No, depending on your health, it can be irreversible brain damage. It's serious, and human nature is such that we only do things that are that are comfortable for us. So what this indicates is that Chauvin has done this before because he was so comfortable with it. Think about it. Even if you drive to a, um, to a new location for the first time, right? You're nervous. You're trying to find your way. Um, which way? Which way? Which way do I go? Whatever, right? And then once you know how to how to get there, you're fine, right? So for Chauvin to be as arrogant as he was. As calm as he was, tells me he's done this many, many times before. Many times. But this is just the first time perhaps he was taken to task in this way. He wasn't even nervous about people seeing him do it. He was chilling. Yeah, he was. He was chilling with the knee on the back of George Floyd's right. neck. He had no emotions. His hands was in his pockets. Right. He was like, I am the law. Right. There was no emotion. There was no, he did not care. Now, folks who do not agree with the verdict, a lot of folks say, well, I highly doubt that he woke up that day and decided he was going to kill somebody. Well, nobody said that. I right, highly doubt right, that, too. Right, He's right. officer of the law. Nobody said that. Right. But once you are in custody, custody, cust right. custody, excuse me, easy for me to say. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're cuffed, then it is up to the police officers to make sure that you are all right, that you are safe. Correct. What this happened, this was an execution. This was a 21st century lynching. It was. And, and as we, I think that all of us have heard at some point, you are innocent until proven guilty. Part of being a police officer and part of the training, I know people who have actually taught um, at the police academy, is that as a police officer, you have to be 
as objective as you can and be able to keep your emotions in check, even if you think, okay, this guy probably is guilty. What separates policemen from the public is that they are able to maintain professionalism, keep their biases out of it, and apprehend the suspect while maintaining the dignity of the suspect and maintaining his constitutional rights. They just behaved as though they were just someone off the street who said, okay, this guy, I think this guy is guilty. I'm just going to arrest him. So, but, but again, what is disturbing is that Chauvin had this arrogance as though I can do what I want. And to me, just for that, even if Mr. Floyd had lived, she's still gone to prison. That's what I think. There, there needs to be a precedent, whereas as an officer of the law, there is a certain standard that must be maintained. That is, you cannot take the law in your own hands. If, if that were the case, it would just be like the wild, wild west where they would just do, you know, they'd execute you or whatever, shoot you if you did something, you know, uh, you know wrong. But, you know, we have to have some sort of civility don't you think? I mean, but but the way that they did it and and you know, and just just sort of delving further, it's clear that Mr. Floyd had a history of criminal uh criminal acts. We don't know if he had a mental health issue. We don't we have no idea if he was um under medication. We don't know. We don't know his 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 entire circumstances. Apparently, he was very, very good friends with uh, Stephen Jackson. Jackson. Very good. They used to call him twins. If you look at pictures of them, they're twins. So Stephen Jackson actually said he had just sent him a box of clothing and that he, he'd always tried to help him out a little bit. But just mentioned- Stephen Jackson is a uh, former NBA player for, for all the streamers out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stephen Jackson. And, um, and, they, and, they, they, and they knew each other from Texas, I believe. They're good friends. And, you know, just a really nice guy who just maybe lost his way but again it does not give anyone the right to be judge and jury to kill someone because you just want to and um and that's why what this juror did um mr uh brandon mitchell um having his picture posted with him with that t-shirt can jeopardize all of this jeopardize it all and then also I was as mentioning to, to Nestor, uh, Brandon Mitchell has been has been doing the interview gauntlet, CBS, Good Morning America, the Today Show, ABC, ABC, other local stations. So all of this can be used as evidence to what to get the appeal and get a second trial. After that guilty verdict, all the jurors should adjust. You want this? You want this verdict to stick? But now it's in jeopardy. All that is certainly is bad optics. Yeah. And for the streamers out there, as Valley broke down stuff that it could have been, you know, mental health, we don't know. We don't know what his conditions mm-hmm. was and all that. What, right. what Valerie uh, did not mention, and I want to mention this because I don't want to, I, I don't want myself or Valerie to be accused of just skipping over uh, a fact. So, yes, there was a fact that there was drugs in his system. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there, was, there was drugs in the system. Yes. So that was a fact. Okay. So, I don't know about you, Val. I don't know about all the people that you know in your life, but the people I've known in my life, very, very, very few people have never tried a drug in their life. Like, I can honestly say I've never tried a drug in my life. I've, I've never, never tried. You know, okay, so we got two people right here right. that have never tried a drug in their <laughs> life, had never put anything to our faces to smoke, have never have no. never, have never, never popped a, 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 a recreational drug, have never done this. It's just, so we've never done drugs, right? I mean, I... I popped some candy. (laughs) Yeah, but... um, Yeah, we haven't done drugs, right? But the majority of the society have done drugs, whether it's um, soft drugs like marijuana or the harder stuff. Mm -hmm. So I want the streamers to sit down there and to just think about it. All the folks that you know that have done drugs, whatever level of drugs they have, whatever level of drug usage, did that person deserve to be executed? No, not at all. And um, and, and not to um, impugn anyone for their choices at all. We're all different. We're, we're all different. What I'm, what I'm saying about this particular case with, um, with Mr. George Floyd was that this was a critical mass of a lot of bad issues at the same time, compounded with a bad, bad cop. 
it could have been handled very differently um, because I believe when I saw the, the video footage when they were trying to put Mr. Floyd into the police car, I guess he was um, claustrophobic. He was nervous. Yes. So when you combine someone who is panicking, has anxiety, he doesn't want to go back to jail, he doesn't want to go to prison, and then he's being forced into this small car, anyone can have a panic attack. Anyone. One of the things about, about the human body, no one knows how they're going to react under a certain amount of stress. So, you know, low levels of stress, you, maybe you can predict. When you're under extreme stress um, with, with respect to being arrested or you have a bunch of policemen, you know, they're on top, whatever, you really don't know how you're going to react until you get there. And so with Mr. Floyd um, being under the influence, he was just reacting the, the way his body did. Um, but again, it was the responsibility of the police officers to maintain his safety, to give the minimum amount of aggression required to neutralize the situation, get him in handcuffs, and safely get him um, to jail. They now, didn't do that. Now, the initial arresting officers was Officer Lane and Officer Quang, both yes. Both are rookies. Yes. So, them being rookies, right, we know that police officers are also there to de-escalate. So, mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not a police officer. I don't know what goes on in there. I don't know how smart it is to have a couple of rookies being partners, I would think. And I don't know. So, I would think that you want a vet to partner up with a rookie so we can show the rookie the ropes. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe it was a staffing issue. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. And before I go on, I want to tell the streamers out there that both myself and Valerie, we are pro-policemen. We are pro-law enforcement. We're not painting a brush. We're not saying police are bad because oh, we no. all know that. You know, We are talking about the individuals who are the bad police, those individuals. So we're talking about Chauvin, Tao, Lane, and Quang. We're right. not talking about police departments in general. Mm -hmm. Those four police officers, and especially Derek Chauvin, just want to make it clear for the streamers. And and, and what, one of the things that I noticed when I was watching the video, I wanted to point out, it was almost as if Chauvin was showing off. The way, like, that's how I saw it, like he was showing off for the rookies. Now, one of the things is that people act differently in a group than they do individually. So I remember a policeman had told me a long time ago that if you're ever walking down the street alone, he said, always be aware of groups because people behave differently. So, for example, the lootings that happened in Minneapolis. Now, the average person isn't going to go into a Target and just take everything. He's not going to do it. Now, you take 2,000 people running into Target Knock, and no, there's no one there. The average person who may not even think about stealing something may say, hmm, I do need a free towel. You know what I mean? They may say, so So kind of uh, bringing this back to, to Chauvin, would he have acted the same way if he were alone or with one other police officer? I don't know. But, but it does lend itself to kind of take that into, into consideration. Was he showing off for these rookies? And even in that respect, he was showing rookie policemen how not to behave. I mean, it's ho it's horrible all the way around. And when they read the verdict, I don't know if you were watching Chauvin's face. Now, do you see Chauvin's face? I saw it. He looked surprised. Did you notice that? He looked surprised. Like what? I don't. I thought he thought he was going to get off. Didn't you think that? Did you? I didn't think that he looked surprised. I thought to me that it was just like he he stayed. Cons constant the entire time that no emotion mm -hmm. i actually thought in my interpretation of what i saw is that his lawyer probably came back to him and said they deliberated in eight to ten hours you're going away so I, you I, think I, so? I, I just want you to be prepared that you are going away so prepare prepare for the worst that I, was my interpretation of it but you know what you are certainly more in tune to body language and stuff that you know than i am I mean, granted, he was wearing a a mask mm. as well, wearing a mask and stuff. So he right. was wearing a mask. So I saw, I saw the eyes, 
but you were certainly more in tune with body languages and stuff like that. So, uh, and th- so, so I'm sorry. So if that was your interpretation, then that's probably the correct inter- the correct interpretation. Yeah, it's just um, and and you know, for the average person, like to kill someone is just would just be devastating, psychologically devastating. I've known people who have served, you know, um, during during wartime. And they say, you know, I've, I've spoken to Marines and people in the Army, and they say, you know, when you go to Afghanistan, places like that, and you have to, you know, do your duty um, as, you know, as a, as a U.S. military person, it's very tough to sort of, um, I don't know, to sort of get that right in your brain to say, I killed someone, but it was for the United States. Because there's still this conflict, you still killed someone. And that's why a lot of military people come back and they need psychological, you know, help. Now, Chauvin, from what I saw, had no emotion. Like, just, he killed someone, so what? You know, and that's what is disturbing. And what's scary, I think, for a lot of people is that how many other policemen are there out there? Now, I do think the vast majority of policemen and women police people are doing their job and trying to do the right thing. But there is a faction of police officers that aren't so great, and those are the ones that need to be kind of rooted out and, you know, fired. I just want to put this out there a couple of minutes ago when you had said how to act in front of a crowd, and maybe that Chauvin was showing off because he had the the rookies there and the stuff. So he was acting a certain way. Would he have acted, would he have behaved differently if the, if the rookies were not there? Well, my question is something for you to think about. Right. Is that there were witnesses there and there were witnesses recording. So right. what would have been his behavior if it wasn't being recorded with his behavior, wow. with his behavior modified and been more brutal probably we don't know i mean again he was so cocky and calm people were recording there was a crowd people were watching he didn't care because he's gotten away with it before a lot and i didn't do my research to see did you did you see how many times that he was brought up on um that there were complaints against him from there was quite a bit right i want to say the number was 17 Oh, it was that high. That that's what I want to say. Oh wow, that's what I want to say. I mean, that is, yeah. and those are just the ones that were reported. Mm-hmm. This is a bad guy, you know. It's criminal, right? He he's a criminal who happened to become a police officer, and that cannot happen. And you know, and it's good, and it's good that, that that we're actually discussing this, and other people are discussing it on different podcasts and on different programming, because it is important. And I, and I'm sure that they do psychological evaluations. I hope when they first vet these candidates to be policemen, but but perhaps or police people, but perhaps there should be stricter psychological guidelines, um, because killing someone. Or thinking that you can kill someone and get away with it is not good. And thank goodness for the body cam. Thank goodness people have. Ca- Imagine if there was no footage of Mr. Floyd. Imagine. Imagine. You know, so that's the part that sort of scares me. Well, the initial police report about the incident was that a person was apprehended and he was um, he was on um, displaying distress right? because he was on drugs. And something else that is not coming to my mind right now, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But there was no mention about the whole knee and all this stuff. Yeah. It, was, it, it was a very superficial report that the police chief had right. si- had signed off on it. Right. Because, like, okay, he had no reason to think otherwise. It wasn't until one of the bystanders posted the video on their Facebook account right. that a police officer went to the police chief and said, I think that you should... Watch this video. Watch that video and fire the four officers instantly. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the way, you know, it, no, it, it should be. Um, and that's why, you know, having body cams are wonderful because it not only protects the, um, you know, the suspect, it also protects the police officer. It goes both ways. It, it gives an objective view of what happened, hopefully. 
But but again, what this case comes down to is one man taking another man's life, and we can't have that. And let me tell you, if you think you're dying, and I believe that Mr. Floyd was actually screaming for his mother. Yes. That is a very, very primal response. It occurred during World War II, as a matter of fact. Go ahead. And I just want to note that his mother had passed away some years earlier. Yes. Yes. So so during World War II, there were reports. Remember, in World War II, you had um, soldiers who were sometimes underage, but, you know, 18 years old. They were just kids, right? So on the battlefield, if someone was shot and they were dying, they would scream for their mother. That is a very, very primal cry for your mother. When someone does that, especially a grown man, it's serious. They are screaming for the one person who you know loves you without condition. So when they heard him cry, I think, Mama, mm-hmm. like, I mean, it's so it's so upsetting to think about. It's so upsetting. And George Floyd is not a little person. George Floyd is six foot four, and he's yeah. built. Yeah, he's built to last. Right. So when that big brother crying for his deceased 250, mother, two fifty was he about two hundred fifty pounds? Yes, right? big yes, guy. Yes. When he's crying for his deceased That's mother. That's right. That's right. And and again, Chauvin showed no uh, empathy, no compassion. And we've actually ta- ta- no, talked about this, Nestor. When someone expires, your body relaxes, um, you know, the muscles become become less uh, toned, you know, everything gets, you know, kind of uh, flimsy. You can feel if someone expires under you. You can feel that. Yeah. You can feel, you can intuitively feel if something is getting serious, where you're like, okay, let me turn this guy over. The fact that Chauvin was able to lean on his neck, in my opinion, I think he's a sociopath. I'm just going to put it out there. That is sociopathic. To be able to take aggression and violence to that point and have no compassion, that is frightening. And that's why um, I think people are so upset as well because we've got these people running around with guns. And that's why people, you know, if a policeman pulls you over and you happen to be a person of color, you're nervous. You're very nervous. You're like, okay. And it could be for something. And I mean, I believe with George Floyd, this where a um, counterfeit $20 bill. $20 bill. $20 bill. All they have to say is, look, this is fake. And he might not even know that he had a fake bill. Right, exactly. He might not even know that. Right. I, essentially, with, with, with like counterfeit bills, you just confiscate it. You confiscate it, rip it up, whatever, turn it over to the police, whatever. All of this stuff was just extra. There was no need for that. Even if Mr. Floyd had had an outstanding warrant, a lot of people have outstanding warrants. You just arrest them. If you need help, you call for backup. They had him handcuffed. He was on the ground. As far as I could see, it was neutralized to the point he wasn't posing a threat to the other police he he was handcuffed. He wasn't he wasn't getting up. I said he was a big guy, but not to warrant putting his knee on his neck. Ooh. And um and I believe in New York, I should have done my research. They've made that illegal. Can't do that anymore. Can't do it at all. Can't do it all. So that so um so ostensibly someone can pin you down by like maybe your shoulders, whatever, your legs, your torso, your hips, but not the neck, not the neck. You have you have the carotid arteries that run through there that provide blood to your brain, which is kind of important, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the brain controls everything, breathing, right? Once you stop oxygen flow to the brain, that that is essentially how you have a stroke. Mm-hmm. So you have a stroke, which means your blood, uh, your uh, your your brain doesn't receive oxygen for a certain amount of time. And depending on how long that period is, it can affect different body systems, your kidney, your of course, your heart and your lungs are all together with that. So this was something that was, if it, unfortunately it happened to Mr. Floyd, but this Chauvin guy, I think would have eventually been caught for killing someone because I don't think he would have stopped. Don't you think he would have, I don't I, think he would have stopped. 
I agree with you. Based on his actions and stuff, I have no reason not to agree with you. He gives me no reason to not to agree with you. So the final chapter of this has not been written yet. So Val, I think this is a good spot to go into our break. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So Nesta Dudley, along with Valerie, who is my sister, not my biological sister, but my sister. Nesta Dudley, Val, see you back on the other side of the break. Welcome to Just a Second with Chris Zell, a show that will take us through the world of knowledge from aardvark mating rituals all the way, if we're lucky, to the long and historic Zell family lineage. Now, let's get to Just a Second with Chris Zell. Hi, I'm Chris. That was Just a Second with Chris Zell. Tune in next time to see what else we can learn in Just a Second with Chris Zell. Welcome to Cooking Without Food, a show that will help all you budget-conscious folks out there who want to get away from the grocery industrial complex and keep your healthy lifestyle and family fed. Let's join our host Sharon and get started on the road to food riches. Hi, I'm Sharon and welcome to Cooking Without Food, the show with the goal of getting our nations off the teats of the grocery industrial complex. <sighs> It turns out it can't be done. I tried and tried and tried, and it turns out no matter how greedy and duplicitous the grocery industrial complex is, we have to eat. This has been Cooking Without Food. Don't bother tuning in next week because in this slot will be another cooking show, Caveman Cooking. Hope they have better luck. <laughs> Hi, I'm James Mudge, and this is Caveman Cooking, where we take you back in time to the days of the caveman. Well, <laughs> I know it may be a stretch when you hear cars going by every few seconds, but you know what? We're going to give it a try. And although we looked all over the place, we just could not find any Mastodon meat to cook. So, we'll have to make do with this chuck that I took from my mother's fridge, and this potato. By the way, Ma, I need to do some chuck. So, we're going to cook this meat just like the caveman did. But first, we're going to need a fire. And we're gonna do it just like the way the caveman did, by banging rocks together. How hard could it be? Starvation did not cause the caveman to go extinct. It's been raining a little bit there, so I'll have to try a little harder. I'm sure we can do it. So, I'm sure the first caveman to make fire, who I have on very reliable sources, name was Urg, did not have an easy time at first. So, I'll keep at it and keep trying. they did it. I'm sure then more than a dozen of them went mad trying to do it. Oh, I'm done. Oh, let's go get pizza. Oh, this was a stupid idea in the first place. <laughs> Welcome to the exciting world of Lint. Today, we're going to learn everything that's interesting about Lint. 
In today's episode, we're going to teach you everything that Lint is good for. Stop killing black people. Period. Stop killing black people. Nesta Dudley back here with my sister Valerie. And we are going to talk about Dante Wright, who was murdered by a police officer, Kimberly Potter, 10 miles away from the Derek Chauvin trial. I think this was day one of the trial. Was that right, Val? No, this occurred on April um, 11th of uh, 2021 this year um, in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. So what was um, upsetting about this is that uh, Officer Potter, at the time, now she's not an officer, mistakenly used her firearm and shot Dante in the chest and killed him. He actually, after he was shot, he took off in the car, but he died at the scene. She mistakenly uh, thought, want, used her gun instead of the taser. Now, the issue with this is that the taser is on the left side, the gun is on the right side. Kimberly Potter was a 26 year veteran. And, Repeat that. Yes, Kimberly Potter was a 26 year veteran and president at the time of the police union she should have known better and she trained officers and she was training that yes she was she was training officers that day she was training officers yes you are being very down the middle and professional when you say mistakenly i'm not going to take that route she knows the difference between a taser and a gun. Yeah. And a block. She knows the difference. Yeah. Because if she did not know the difference, that would make her a moron. And they, they just, and, they and, ju- and they look different. Right. And she is nobody's moron. 26 wow. year vet, president of the union, oh, training gosh. folks, the weight difference between a Glock and a taser is very prominent. You can tell the Glock is on your dominant side of the holster. The taser is on your opposite hot side, so, right. so 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 it it is designed that you reach across your body for the taser. Mm-hmm. A Glock, there's no lock on the Glock, but you gotta unlock a taser. So yes, yeah, so once again, to the streamers out there, if she she knew the difference between a gun and a taser, if she did not know, that would make her a moron. She is not a moron. She knew. Yeah, it's. It, it's it's upsetting because now um, a young man has lost his life. His parents, who were devastated, his, I, I saw the interview. They were devastated. I just want to say, a young man had his life taken from him. And his parents have now lost their son. They lost their son. And uh, and as we spoke in the in the earlier part of this podcast about the Chauvin case, it's you know, is it a case of retraining um, you know police officers a little differently, but you know, Kimberly Potter, she's been around for a long time. She should have known better. She should have known better. One shot to the chest, took him out. There were, I saw the video on this one as well. Um, he was resisting arrest. Um, they were they were trying to, um, to get him out of the car. She, she yelled, taser, taser. After she shot him, she yelled an expletive and said, oh, my gosh, I just shot him. So the police chief at the time used that as evidence that it was a mistake. But mistake or no, she killed him. She killed him. And you can't say sorry to that. You can't say, I'm sorry I I shot your son. He's dead now. He's dead. So just give you a little bit of background on Dante. Um, When they had pulled him over, it was for a vehicle violation they found that he had an outstanding warrant, um, and so they were going to take him into custody. Dante resisted. Um, this, which, which is never the thing to do. Which is never, of course not. And there was a scuffle. 
Uh, Officer Potter uh, shot him. After she shot Dante Wright, he took off in the car. The car crashed. I would presume because he was dying. Um, he lost control of the car, and he was dead at the scene. He was dead at the scene. Officer Potter was, um, at the time, they had interviewed the police uh, chief, and he had said, well, based on the video, it, it was a mistake. In any event, Officer Potter was arrested. She's being charged with second-degree manslaughter. She was able to bond out, and she will be coming up for trial. But um, looking uh, from what I saw again, they're saying that the max is 10 years. They think because of the circumstances and that they believe it was an accident, she may only serve four years, if that. She may even serve less than four years because she has no prior criminal record. So again, you know, what is a life worth? You know, if, if, if someone lost their son and someone just got to serve four years, I'd be upset because it was a mistake, but it doesn't matter. As a police officer, she's not supposed to make mistakes like that. What do you think, Nestor? That was really an egregious mistake. So, yeah. again, I said in the first half of this podcast that I'm not a police officer. I don't work in law enforcement and all that, so I don't know all the rules. But basically, from the information I gathered, and I also seen the same video footage as well, is that when you take somebody out the car, you know, you're supposed to take them to the back of the cop car. They were going to arrest him. Mm -hmm. so you're supposed to take him to the back of the car. Mm -hmm. You don't have that person stay on the side of the car because that person has the opportunity to do exactly what Dante did, was just run back into the car right. to drive away, right. which is never the right thing to do. We're not advocating that whatsoever. Right. He should not have done that. Right. And by her, and interesting, you brought up before we, before I press record, the whole yelling taser, taser, taser. You forgot to mention that how... Kimberly Potter yell was yelling taser, taser, taser before she, you know, before she shot him. Cause that's very key. I will make sure that streamers know that because that's because that's part of the defense, as I know it's that, well, you know, she thought she had a taser because she yelled taser, taser, taser. And I give you this, Sister Val. I'm not saying that she did this on purpose. I'm not saying it was premeditated. What I am saying is that she's a 26 year vet, and a lot of cases have come by, so I'm sure that she knows certain things to say or certain things to do to cover herself. So, yes, I saw. Oh, I see. I saw and heard yeah. how she said taser, taser, taser. So, yes, but that wasn't a taser. She knew that wasn't a taser. As I said before, and I'll keep on saying it as long as someone wants to listen to me. If she did not know the difference, that would make her a moron. She's nobody's moron. She knows the difference. A 26-year vet of the uh, head of the police union yeah. training, training trainers. That, you know, she is nobody's moral. Right. She she is a competent police officer. I have a good friend, a mutual good friend, mm. of ours, and I'll tell you the person's name once I get out of the recording here. <laughs> but but he had said, you know, it's wrong. It shouldn't happen. But you know, she probably freaked out because you could be on the police force for multiple years. And never see any type of action, never see any type of ruckus. So maybe she just freaked out. And my answer to him is, well, think about that 20-year-old black man. Mm -hmm. Maybe he freaked out when the police pulled him over and had a gun to his face. Do you think he might have freaked out? And he said, point. He said, point taken. Now, this life was taken, and you had mentioned that a uh, couple have lost their son. Their son got taken away from them. Right. But let's not forget that he also left behind a small child. Yes, it's it, it it's just sad. It's sad all the way around. But just but just getting back to your point about uh, the ex officer Potter should have known the weight. So it was just like uh, what was that Deflated Gate with um, with Tom Brady. Tom Brady knows of football just by he can be blindfolded. He can tell because he has so much experience as a quarterback. He can tell if it's deflated a little bit overinflated so it does stand to question you don't know which you don't know what's a taser and what is a firearm they both have different coloring the taser i believe has has like yellow coloring to it and is on the left side of the body and it's just it's very upsetting and this 
further uh, creates a sort of chasm between the public and um, and police, you know, who are supposed to defend us. Because now, if you get pulled over, in the back of your mind, you don't trust one. Even if even if you know you haven't done anything. So let's say you are a person of color, specifically a male a, a male person of color. In the back of your mind, you're thinking, don't let me mess this up. Let me keep my hands on the wheel. Don't give them an excuse to shoot me. It shouldn't be that way. If you get pulled over for a traffic violation, you get the ticket, you go on your way, you pay your ticket, right? You shouldn't be thinking about, I'm going to die. That's ridiculous. And, you know, unfortunately, in this case with, with Officer Potter, yeah, she needs to go to jail. Mistake or not, when you take the oath and take the oath for that badge, you forfeit the right to freak out. You forfeit the right to get emotional. You have taken an oath to uphold the law and to be able to have the ability to mitigate those emotions and to act to act in fairness whether or not you feel that person is guilty or not. You're not the jury. All you, all you are there to do is to mollify the situation, uh, neutralize whatever threat there is, and get that person arrested, whatever, whatever you're going to do, with minimal, minimal aggression. You know, but this, she, she shot him straight in the chest. And if you cannot keep your emotions in check, if you are going to quote-unquote freak out, then you are in the wrong job. Absolutely. Change your occupation. You can no longer do that job. Absolutely. Or modify your position where you are just doing desk duty. Desk duty. Do not be out in the field. And you know, in, in in, in that vein, if you think about it, maybe once every five years, maybe even less, they should do a psychological screen of all the officers because because when you take your oath, Maybe you're psychologically fit at that point. Maybe you've gone through a trauma in the next five years. I think they should be reevaluated at regular intervals. I don't know if that goes on now, but I really think it should be part of it. If you're carrying a firearm, everyone needs to know that you're psychologically able to handle that because shooting someone is serious. Policemen that I have spoken to have said to me, they don't like going for their gun. They don't even want to do it. They want to do everything they can without going to the gun. I spoke to one police officer, actually local, and he said whenever we have to escalate aggression, he said, I don't even want to do that. I I talk to him. I say, look, I don't want to hurt you. Let's do it. And this is like an actual conversation that I've had with a local police officer. He said, I talk to him. I talk. And he said most of the time they're like, okay, Right? Right. Everybody goes home. Everybody's happy. You know, because because even, you know, in this case with this Officer Potter, she's psychologically damaged as well. So, I mean, she killed someone, yes. Not only has she taken a life, she's taken a little bit of a little bit a little bit of her own as well. I have also spoken to people, I talk to a lot of people, who have who are train operators, specifically the Acela. So uh, one of the things with the Acela, it goes, I believe, 150 miles an hour going from Boston to New York, you know, the Northeast Corridor. So one of the things that happens quite often are that trains hit people, and one of the uh, one of the one of the uh, one of the train operators had said to me, he said, "It is traumatic for us to do that. Sometimes we have to go into counseling." So it's kind of like the conservation of energy, right? You can't destroy energy. It's just kind of transferred. When you take someone's life, whether or not you realize it, you're hurting yourself. So this is why it is so important for officers in any type of law enforcement to not only just say, I can't kill anybody, but just to be fair, try to de-escalate it in, in any way except violence. And in the case with, with Officer Potter, it was incumbent upon her, to, if she said taser, taser, to make sure that was a taser and not her Glock because a Glock and a taser are two different things. And like you said, the weight is different, you know. Um, 
and, and you have to release the safety on the Glock, right? Yeah, they release the safety yeah. on the taser. Uh, uh, the sa- but, but, but also the Glock has a safety on it, right, if it's in the holster. Actually, you know what? Safety Glock, lock taser. I think you have to release a lock on the taser. Okay. There's some type of release mechanism on the taser. Okay. That's obviously a different type of release mechanism mm-hmm. that's on the Glock. So, right. Yes. Right. So, you know, we could have, if we did an interview with Kimberly Potter, Potter mm-hmm. and that's never going to happen. <laughs> but if we interviewed her, she can give you and I such an education on right. the differences between a Glock Exactly. And a taser, exactly. things that you and I would never know, which goes back to the point. If she didn't know what the difference was, that would make her a moron. And she is not no. a moron. No. She was a competent police officer. I mean, it was just tragic. It was tra- There was no, in this case, there was no need to shoot that young man. None. From what I saw, he didn't have a firearm. Did you see anything different? There was no firearm. Their lives from, were from uh, Dante. He did from, from Dante. Yeah, yes, yeah. there were no firearms. Mm-hmm. There, there was no danger mm-hmm. or threat of danger to the right. lives of the police officers. Right. And you said that he got pulled over. He got pulled over because he was hanging air fresheners on the rear view yeah, mirror. I read that. Yeah, air fresheners, which I guess apparently in Minnesota laws and all that, that that's not supposed to happen. So okay, apparently that's like the law. Do you pull over somebody for that? And also that he had the um, the plates. It was the uh, registration plates um, kind of like uh, expired. But there was a um, email put out about that state saying that they were giving leeway because due to COVID and stuff, you couldn't like renew. So there yeah, was like, yeah, a, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. So it just so happens when he pulled him over, then they realized that he had a warrant. Right. Outstanding and, warrant. And outstanding warrant and all that. But, but again, it was just, as you said, it was up to that police officer to, to make sure that you're neutral, you don't escalate, you de-escalate. That was you, ridiculous. You gotta, was. you gotta keep your emotions in check. Absolutely, you gotta keep your emotions in check. And you also said that the police officers that you have spoken with, that the last thing they want to do is like reach for their gun. Yes. And I believe that that's the yes. majority of the police officers. They don't yes. want to reach for the gun. They that's don't the, want to. That's why they're good police officers. Right. So if you reach for your gun as the first instance, that tells me right there you're a bad police officer. And you're it, bad. Absolutely. And and the thing is, you know. And, and, you know, um, another police officer that I spoke to said a lot of times when you're in a situation, you know, it's not like, say, domestic violence situations, you know, the police officer. He said to me, if you just talk to the people, say, look, what happened? You know, we're not here to hurt you. Talking to someone can do a lot. Generally, when people react and they're nervous, they're afraid you're going to hurt them. So if a police officer, perhaps given the situation, says, look, we're not here to hurt you. You have an outstanding warrant. Let's, let's, just, let's get this done. That will help to de-escalate, now, depending on the situation, of course. But if someone doesn't think that you're going to hurt them, they're going to be more amenable to saying, you know what, all right, let me just, you know. Of course, like I said, depending on the situation. But that should be the first go-to, that should be the first to talk to them. And sometimes, like, and not specifically with this case and other videos that I've seen, you'll see the policeman yelling and everything. Whenever you start to yell, the other person has to yell louder. And part of de-escalating a situation is to actually lower your voice. So this also works with children. So instead of, like, kind of trying to yell over them, you actually drop your voice. And then sort of instinctively, they, they also drop their voice. They teach this in customer service as well. But these are tactics that I would believe are taught at the police academy. But this idea of she shot him in the chest, he didn't have a chance. She sh- shot him through the chest, probably got him in the heart. It's over. It's over. He might have lived for another few minutes and then bled out. Um, but like I said, I saw the interview with his parents. Devastated. I can't. And he has a small child, he said. He has a small child. I and, can't imagine. And what we didn't mention is that... Dante Wright was biracial. Yes, yes. White mother. And yes, yes. when he got pulled over, he was on the phone with his mother and it's like, I'm being pulled that's over. That's right, that's right. And she was like, oh okay, baby, God. just comply and just make sure, you know, because the bottom line is you want to make sure that he comes home. Yeah. Maybe comply and all that. So the mother was, so the mother was on the phone. So she was a witness. And who knows what happened after he was shot. 
I don't know if his mother, if the line was still open, if he was even able to hold on to the phone. But she will never forget that day for the rest of her life. And so, so in this case, there wasn't just one victim. It was his child, if he had a significant other, his father, his grandparents, his sisters, brothers. I mean, and so that's why I'm very happy that this, uh, that Kimberly Potter was arrested and brought up on charges of second degree manslaughter. I'm glad because it, it it needs to set a precedent. Police officers need to know that they have an outstanding responsibility to the public first, to the public. Even if someone is a criminal, you still have a responsibility to treat them with respect. And that's why they have the uh, Miranda rights that they have to, uh, they say, even though you know I might think you did it, they might think you did it, these are your rights. You have the right to remain silent and all that. And with the Miranda rights, that's actually advantageous for the police because we all know the Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. Mm -hmm. But pay attention to the next phrase of that and really think about this. And this is something that somebody had pointed out to me. Anything that you say can and will be held against you. Yes. So we all focus on, well, I got the right to remain silent. But we don't focus on that. They pot anything you say can and will be held against you. So that means from that point, anything that you utter, it can and will be held against you. Because there's a right. presumption of innocence. Yes. You have to be proven guilty. Yes, and that's why attorneys will tell their client, you say nothing until I get you say nothing. And that's why when you see interviews, sometimes a person will say, I don't want to say anything until my attorney is here. Because, of course, an attorney has been to law school and they know all the legalities and they can better advise you than, say, if you, you haven't been to law school. And, you know, but it's true. And but but it goes back to even if you are, quote unquote, a criminal, you're guilty, you are innocent until proven guilty or it should be that way in our country and that even when you are arrested, you have rights. And even if you are arrested and put in jail or prison, you still have rights. And that's why we have prison advocates. Um, I mean, it goes case by case, of course, but there are certain fundamental rights that should be always upheld and uh, implemented, and that people who take the oath and, uh, and have that badge on their chest need to be held to a higher standard. Absolutely. And, and just like you said, Nestor, if you get, if you're emotional, you can't handle, uh, you know, uh, confrontations, aggression, you're in the wrong job. You need get to out. quit. You need to quit. You need get to out. quit or do desk duty. If you are a personal trainer mm -hmm. and you can't touch your toes, <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe, true. maybe you shouldn't be a personal trainer. It's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's true. And, and it doesn't make you a, a bad or bad or good person. It makes you a smart person. You identify what your strengths are and say, okay, I'm not good at, you know, not shooting my gun at people. Maybe I shouldn't be a police officer. But um, but I like to just emphasize again that the vast majority of law enforcement are good men and women. They just want to do their job, and they want to go home to their family just like everyone else. But there are a number of bad seeds out there, and it's up to the public and also in the police force to root them out and get rid of them because they do no one any good. And the bad seeds, the bad cops ruin it for the Absolutely. good cops. Absolutely. And the majority of law enforcement is good. They are. It's just that the bad right. just gives a bad name across the board. Right. And, and again, like the police officer that I spoke to, he said, we don't want to shoot anyone. He said, that's the last thing we want. We don't. And he said, it's just, it's bad all the way around. He said, you never want to reach for your gun. You never want to reach for your gun. You just don't want to do it. Anybody who likes reaching for the, there's something wrong with them. They're if, in the wrong profession. They absolutely. are in the wrong profession. Absolutely. Be a professional hunter. Mm -hmm. Go hunt game. I don't know what your stance is about that. Go hunt game. Right, right, right. Human, and, human beings are not game. Ex exactly. And, and, and just like we were saying with Dante, he had a baby, a mom and dad, people who loved him, irrespective of whether or not he had a, a criminal history. He's still someone's son. They're, they're, he shouldn't feel as though if he gets pulled over that, 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 that he may lose his life. It shouldn't be that way. If someone 
goes to trial and they are sentenced to prison or the death penalty, that's something separate. But just the initial arrest, there should be a standard protocol that is followed, and that's it. And then the police officers don't fo- don't follow that. They should be brought up on charges. And in this case, second degree manslaughter. That's it. There is a standard protocol that is followed. The problem is that it's not followed against all of America. Right. It's only followed for a certain segment of America. Right. Or, in other words, a certain segment of America is excluded. Yeah. Of that. And that, and that could go on to like another podcast and we're not going to, and we're not going to have that discussion on this podcast. (laughs) Exactly. But, 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 um, but it's just, it's what I, I really feel it's, um, a wonderful thing to see people of all different ethnicities supporting this idea that police should be held to a higher standard, that, 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 that we all should be treated fairly, that no group is above any other group and that there should be clinical standard of care uh, dictated by, uh, by, uh, by uh, law enforcement. And I really like that. And so even with the uh, demonstrations in Minneapolis last year, you saw people of all different races, all different races supporting. Now, I'm not advocating the violence portion of it, but I'm just saying just, just like in general. Well, the violent portion of it was certainly different. Those are folks that just want to go out there and loot and show right. out and all that. Right. I did say, and I'm glad that you mentioned that, but brought that up and we didn't bring it up in the first half of this podcast that the one thing, cause I was very cynical. I'm like, this is, you know, he's going to get off. I was like numb to this whole thing. Again, stop killing black people. Period. Yeah. But what was encouraging with the protest, the peaceful protest mm-hmm. about the Floyd murder is that you saw a whole bunch of different flavors out there. Yes. And the majority of flavors was vanilla flavors. Yeah, it was great. And that was a beautiful thing to see. Because, Val, you know for a fact, white people are not going to listen to black people. White people are going to listen to other white people. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. So that George Floyd murder was an awakening. White America, the white America that have a clean conscience, that are human beings, that know what they saw, they were like, WTF, we didn't realize. Right. We've heard this happen, but we didn't realize this happened. This is not right. Doesn't matter what color you are. This is wrong. Right. And this is where social media, I mean, there are a lot of negatives to social media. One of the positives is that when something goes down, everybody sees it. So, you know, so once, so again, going back to the George Floyd, the Dante Wright. All you have to, um, if someone, you know, records this on their phone or you, you can just post it, post it. Everyone sees it. That's the great thing. Nothing, nothing is a secret anymore. And that's why body cams are great. Um, uh, what's it, the dash cam on the cam, on the cars? Yep. Those are great because now nothing is hidden. And the way it is now, as soon as you walk out on the street, there's a camera somewhere. Even on the highways, I think every, like, Maybe half. I don't know. They have the cameras up on the highways now. Oh, they get you. Yeah, they do, and they can they can trace you. And I I think it's great. It's just like um, here in Boston um, during the Boston uh, Marathon bombing. It took them a couple of days, but they were able to piece together mm-hmm. right yep, all of right. the footage outside the stores to find those guys in cave. They got they got them very, very quickly. So that's where... Um, and the technology wasn't even as sophisticated as it is today. Right. And now, anything that happens, a person can pull out their phone and record, and they got you, and there's nothing anyone can say. And so that's why with, like... So imagine, in this case, with Dante Wright, if no one got this on film, imagine she would have never been arrested. Think about it. Right. Well, think about it. Same thing we talked about Derek Chauvin. Mm-hmm. Derek Chauvin. It took a bystander mm-hmm. that posted the video on their right. social media, on their Facebook. That's right. And then the, the police chief mm-hmm. saw that. Right. And right. then the dominoes fell. Right, right. And so, and, so like, and so once again, having technology, there are a lot of negatives, but there are a lot of positives, especially in cases like this, to see that justice is done. And this weekend... Hold law enforcement to a higher standard because someone is watching you. Somebody. (laughs) (laughs) And that is a... 
perfect way to end this podcast. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, Val, I just want to say that I had so much fun doing this podcast with you. And I'm going to ask you right now in front of the streamers that I want to make this a, a series of podcasts entitled Stop Killing Black People, where we talk about people that have had their lives taken from them. And we can also talk about people that have not had their lives taken from them. I mean, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, there was the case that of that um, of that army doctor that got pulled over in Virginia. And, you know, he wasn't shot, um, but he was done wrong. And I had told you that I think the only reason why he didn't get shot, the only thing that saved his life was that he was wearing his army fatigues. I think where his army fatigues saved his life. So yeah, but I just want to have a series of podcasts where we discuss things like I, this. I think it'd be great, and 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 just you know to bring awareness and you know to what's going on, and it's just it's just good to talk about stuff like this and just to flesh out you know the the uh, the uh, the uh, situational um, evidence that's there because each each case is different but similar at the same time. And to just, you know, like I said, discuss this and, and, get, and get the word out there to people that, that these are issues that are very important and that affect, affect all of us, even if we're not related to these people, it affect, affects everyone. So thank you. And I got you on the record. That thank you, you Nesta. <laughs> Beyond the Rim is available on Apple Podcast. Beyond the Rims available on Spotify. Beyond the Rims available on Google Podcast. Beyond the Rims available on Stitcher. Beyond the Rims available on Amazon Music. Beyond the Rims available on Podbay. Beyond the Rims available on TuneIn Radio. Beyond the Rims available on iHeartRadio. Beyond the Rims available on YouTube or wherever you stream your podcast. Visit our website, btrmike.com. That's BTR. M-I-C dot com where you can stream past episodes and discover additional podcast platforms where Beyond the Rim is available. Hashtag follow, hashtag stream, hashtag retweet, Twitter handle at Nesta Dudley. So until next time, all you streamers, buenas noches, hooches cooches. I came in peace. I leave with love. This is for the red, the black, and the green. Living cool, living calm, living clean. Ah.